Okay, got it. Yep. What have we got, Ryan? What have we got? 26 so far. Yep. I'm calling the meeting to order. Welcome to this special online meeting. As Rotarians, we offer service to change lives through valuing the fellowship, friendship, and fun in our club. We recognize and acknowledge the diverse backgrounds and needs of our members and community. From the original inhabitants of the land we share to the successive generations that followed. Together, we have a collective impact. Please welcome your presiding officer today, President Paul Denver. Thank you, Rajiv. Um, welcome everybody to this unique online meeting, especially to our guest speaker, our very own Rotarian Jason Bird, who will be more formally introduced later, not that he needs it, we all know him very well. Uh, I'd also like to welcome guests uh, and uh, other visitors. There's um, a lady, uh, Jules Collins, is Jules with us now? No. Not yet. Hi, Heidi, let me know that... Jules was going to join us today, so uh, we'll say hello to her when she comes on. Um, birthdays. Birthday this, this week, uh, Roscoe Shelton on the 16th, Frida Cheok on the 20th, Grant Stevens on the 21st, and Jeffrey Miller on the 22nd. So happy birthday to all of those people. Anniversaries, we have a couple this week. Um, Tracy Wallace, three, uh, plus one at a previous club. And we have Wes Hatcher, uh, 14. Um, announcements and other reminders, um, please remember to check the bulletin, um, Facebook and WhatsApp for any other messages. Uh, you will have noticed that the Area 12 um, potential dinner or planned dinner for the 23rd of February has been uh, altered. Um, the problem with the COVID restrictions was that they could only have 50 people in the pavilion restaurant and we would plan to have 200. So it's been pushed back now to April. Um, hopefully it will go ahead then. And what we're doing instead on the 23rd is we're looking to, we're probably going to have a an evening meeting ourselves. We've got a board meeting tonight and we just need to uh, confirm that that will happen. So we'll let you know probably tomorrow that um, we're planning to have an evening meeting on the 23rd of February. That information will come out to you by email and in the bulletin as well. Um, please uh, remember to contribute to our um, charitable uh, uh, projects by pl uh, placing donations online obviously uh, they're going to be quite down at the moment with us not meeting face to face so if you're able to make a donation that would be greatly appreciated we're now going to move into our spotlight on service and i'd like to introduce today adriano who's going to talk with us about the causes and donations on the club website so over to you adriano you're on mute Is adriano <laughs> That's the phrase of the last two years, isn't it? They're on mute. And oh, drat my mask. Yes. yes. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Gotcha, yes. Andrew. Yes. No, and the, can you see my screen as well? Can you see? Yes, the yes we can. Yes. Okay. So just we just thought we'll um, run you through the section on our website where donations can be done. So we've got a section under the menu, taking action, and then explore our causes. So if you go into this section here, then you basically are presented with a list of uh, um, causes that we are supporting at the moment. Um, these causes can be sorted by, can be grouped by type of, uh, by type. So you've got basically education and health, local community, um, uh, wider global community. So if you do youth education and health, for example, we, you get just those particular um, causes. And um, if we go back to show, uh, uh, we can see all the causes that we've got there. Uh, then if you want to donate one specific cause, it's just a matter of uh, simply selecting the, the cause that you're interested in and then clicking the donate button next to it. And this will take you into the page for that cause specifically, um, where you can select uh, the donation process, very straightforward. You basically select the amount to, uh, that you want to donate, if it isn't one of the fixed amount that we've got set up in there without having to type it in. Otherwise, you can actually type in whatever amount you like um, that is not actually a part of this preselection. Whether the donation is a, a one time or recurring, I'll go through this in a minute to, to elaborate a bit more. And then you just fill your details. 
you can decide to make the donation anonymous if you want to, and then you click process donation, and this will just take you to the PayPal page where you can pay either via your PayPal account or via your credit card. A bit like we do now for the booking of the lunches. Um, so what I also want to show you or mention is that if you are unsure who to donate to, like um, out of our shawl selection, we go back here, um, an option is, is to donate to the community projects, which is what Paul had mentioned earlier on uh, today, um, in terms of uh, obviously any donations that is made to community projects uh, will then, you basically then leaving to the board to make a decision on where the money will be donated based on the requirements and the needs of the board is established. And I think that's a very good way to go about it because uh, the, the club also commits and, and does a budget, the board does a budget at the beginning of the year, decides who they're going to help, and then they need to fulfill those uh, um, uh, targets, obviously, by donations that are received, uh, and it's this This is a very good way to do it. Now, um, just to touch by, back on the recurring, as you know, obviously, it's customary to donate $5 at every lunch, um, or three dollars, or used to be five dollars. So it, you you could create once a five dollars donation, make it recurring, select the frequency of the recurring. So for example, weekly, and then fill your detail and submit this. If you do this, then your credit card or your PayPal account will be debited uh, every week for the five dollars without you to have to do it again. And you can decide the number of occurrences. So if you want this to last, for example, for six months, then you put 26 in here, which will be the 26 weeks or et cetera. Or you can decide that you want to run it only for four weeks or eight weeks or 10 weeks. It just means that if you do this and you set it up, you don't have to do it again. The system will, will um, grab the $5 from you automatically. Adri Simon had a message. Yeah, uh, just uh, what I was going to say is I'm happy to take calls. But I think what we thought is we run, because generally there has been more time, but we run the, get, the guest speaker, we run the question to the guest speakers, and then if there is any questions, we can then uh, um, deal with them after the meeting. But I'll take uh, Simon's only because I know that Simon has been part of this. So, yes, Simon, go ahead. Um, thanks, Adrian. I just mentioned on the chat line there that this, you don't have to necessarily go hunting through the drop down menus. It's accessible directly from the login landing page for members. There's yeah. a donation section that takes you directly to this page. Okay, so that's obviously, but some members might not know uh, obviously their login details. So this can be done without having to log in. But Correct. if you do log in, yes, then that obviously we'll look at that as well. You land into a page where you can. Uh, uh, let's do it. I'm just going to log with me. Oops. So once we log in, the website takes us directly to this member portal menu. And so in our, inside here, yeah, obviously, it's, there is make donations. I suppose this is what you're referring to, Simon? Yep, that's correct. Yep. Yeah, so and if we click this button here, there it is. We land stride on this section. Um, now, the last thing I want to say is that if there is a cause and you want to share the cause with your friends, which is really important as well. So uh, it's a simple matter of going into one of the events, donate now. And then there is an option at the top here that comes up here. There is a tweet. So you can actually share a tweet about it, or you can share the actual this page specifically, which in this case is the science and engineering donation page. And you just click for example, if you want to share it on Facebook, but there is other way like Gmail, LinkedIn, et cetera, email, whatever your email application is, and then you can create an email to a friend or a group of friends. But if you just click Facebook, then automatic, I'm not logged in at the moment into Facebook, but this will just start a post. If you uh, basically it will ask you to log in uh, and then it, that's it. It will start a post for you here. And then you can decide if you want to post it as a story or if you want to do it on your news feed and or both, you can do them both. Then you can put a message and say, friends, this is the science and engineering challenge, a good cause, whatever. And then you can decide who you want to share it with, if it is only friends uh, or public, for example. And then it, it basically shared publicly. So somebody else can reshare it without any limitation. So I suggest that would be a good, a good option here is to go to public on both of these two. And, and then just simply a matter of changing, clicking post to Facebook. 
And now that post will go automatically on your Facebook and then other people can easily reach this page to donate. I think this is all for me. Thanks, Adri. Uh, do you want to take any questions, Adri, or no? I, I think if there are questions, I'll take them after the questions so, to okay. Jason. Okay. So I can so, stick around as well, and we can do it after that if we've got time. So or even I can, I can stay back. Yeah, if you can stop sharing your screen now. Yep. yep. Jason, do you have a presentation? Are you, are you sharing? I do. Okay. I do, Raj. But believe it or not, while I've done lots of Zoom meetings over the last two years, I have never done a presentation. So this is going to be interesting. Okay, so uh, means if you want to, you can share it. Otherwise, you can send it to me, and I'll share it for you. There we go. I think I've, I think I've got that right. Okay, quick introduction of Jason. I know uh, we don't need to introduce Jason. He's been an <laughs> integral part of a club for the past five years, or uh, six years or more. Jason's always been in uh, hospitality, tourism, but I think two or three years he had a change of heart and went to Telstra, and quickly realized that it's not for him. He's come back. <laughs> so he's been at Stamp the hotels and then he's been at uh, uh, from memory South Australian Cricket Association Adelaide Oval uh, which is SMA and for the past uh, three and a bit years at uh, National Wine Centre of Australia. So the topic which uh, Jason's chosen today is very interesting. What is the role of National Wine Centre? We all have been to the National Wine Centre for a meeting or for not the test match dinner. But as uh, the part of the university family, we know that there's a very large role for National Wine Centre rather than just having events. So that's what Jason is going to focus on. Welcome, Jason. It's all yours. Thanks, Raj. Rajiv, I really appreciate that. Um, guys, you all know me reasonably well, so I won't go for too much preamble, but I know that a lot of the members will remember very keenly the period of debate around the actual construction of the National Wine Centre because it's a state government-owned building. Um, and as we, as we go through the presentation, you'll, you'll see how that's moved through in the timeline uh, between 2001 when it was opened and today. So um, it won't surprise any of you knowing me to know that the National Wine Centre is built on land that was originally the Adelaide Lunatic Asylum. <laughs> um, and that's, uh, that's Botanic Road that you can see there. So are you um, taking jokes on that, Jason? No, or you will, will, will we wait for till the end of oh, the no, 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 no. I'm, I'm happy for you guys to, you know, give it to me when you like. <laughs> After, during the presentation, we'll relax me, so go right ahead. That'll be good. <laughs> what you can see here is the East Lodge. Now, that still exists. That's still there on Botanic Road on, as you look across from, uh, from the parks. So that will give you some reference as we go through the next couple of, um, couple of slides. And there you were, 19, up to 1902, it was the asylum and then became part of the Royal Adelaide uh, Hospital um, as part of the uh, infectious diseases block and was eventually demolished in 1938. There are still some existing buildings, though, that uh, are, are part of that, um, that heritage. Jason, can I just ask, can you go back a slide? Back two now. What, um, yeah, what, back one more. What are the buildings up in the, the top right-hand corner? That's the story. story. Yeah. That's it. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so there's the building completed in 2001. As you can see, it's structured around a wine barrel. That's the architectural concept. Now, for those of you who are architects in the group, um, I absolutely have the utmost respect for people who create beautiful buildings. However, I really do wish sometimes that we thought more about how we would clean windows. Um, because there's, there's some real challenge in getting to glass in some of these spaces. However, obviously it was open as a tourism attraction. That's what it's for. Um, a wine education facility and, importantly, as an administrative home for the industry. Um, South Australia does produce 50% uh, of the, the Great Crusher, actually a little bit more than that recently. 80% of premium wine in Australia is, is made here in South Australia. So that's why it's the natural home, although a couple of people in the Hunter Valley still believe that... Um, that uh, John Howard gave the funding because he needed three seats in South Australia. So I have that argument with some of those people. Um, so Premier John Olson opened this venue on the 6th of October in 2001. The original um, CEO of the venue is actually now Senator Anne Ruston. Um, so she's, uh, she's got a good history. And believe it or not, Simon Birmingham actually worked in Industry House, which you can see there when he was part of Australian Grape and Wine. So... 
Here's the entire precinct settled down on, on the corner of Botanic Road and uh, of Decatable Terrace. You can see the East Lodge there, which I've referenced. The main building, uh, Yarraby House, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a moment. Uh, Industry House, and then the world's only CBD wine producing vineyard. Uh, tucked in there behind Industry House, and that's a, a partnership that we, we have in place. So um, originally there was a fair bit more land that was given to the National Wine Centre precinct, but that over the years that's been pared back and given back to uh, the Botanic Gardens for, first of all, the Australian Native Garden, which you can see referenced there, and off to the top of where that screen is, to the wetlands project that's been uh, completed there. All right. Now, the blue star there shows you where most people enter the building. But interestingly, there is a western entrance that interfaces into the garden, and uh, that's perhaps one of the things that, that we'll be working on over the next few years to, to reorient the centre back towards the CBD, particularly with the uh, emergence of Lot 14 and all of the cultural uh, precinct up and down the, the boulevard. All right, so the main building, we do tours and tastings, education. Uh, we've got a cafe, 120 wines on taste. I know a few of you have partaken of that from time to time. And obviously, we do a great number of functions. Uh, in 2019, which is the last year that I really consider to be a normal year, uh, we did 993 events, um, functions at events in the building. So it's a fairly busy function centre. Industry House, as I've referred to, it's one of the reasons why the National Wine Centre was built in the first place. Um, currently houses Wine Australia, which is the statutory body that looks after wine and, and exporting and all of those kind of things uh, for the federal government, the South Australian Wine Industry Association and Australian Grape and Wine, who are both um, industry associations and lobby groups. Uh, Vine Health, who are responsible for the biosecurity of uh, the grape crop here in South Australia. Interestingly, um, you know, here in South Australia, we've never had phylloxera and, and that's why we've got the oldest vines and some of the oldest vines in the world. Um, because it ripped through Europe in the 1890s. We've still got, as most of you know, you go up to the Barossa Valley and you've got, you know, vines from 1843 and, and there's some old bush Grenache stuff out by the valley wall that's really old, um, a little bit older than that even. So they have, a, they have a board of eight and a staff of three, but they are responsible for keeping uh, our vineyards safe from a biosecurity perspective. And Fisheries Research and Development Corporation, it's an agriculture building and they're a bit of a ringing, but, uh, you know, they're one of our tenants in there as well. This is Yarraby House, um, originally the home of the resident medical officer of asylum. I sometimes feel like I've got a similar role. Um, it's under National Trust Protection and it's now our administration building. It's also a really good place to watch revenue generation from the traffic uh, camera that's just across the other side of the Kettable uh, because that's where my office is and I see it straight out and I'm constantly distracted by flashes of people donating money to state government coffers, which is... Obviously, very publicly minded of. So we'll talk about this CBD vineyard a little bit more now. Um, it contains at least one vine from every region in Australia, and it's got a oh. whole heap of varietals. So uh, there's Cabernet, there's from Cabernet to Riesling and everything in between. Um, not as many of the uh, emerging varietals that we're seeing in Australia now, like the you know Montepulciano and. Um, things that are coming out of Georgia and Slovenia and things that are, you know, Assyrtiko out of Greece. But all you can do when you have all of those different grapes is make a field blend rosé. And we're really lucky because uh, with the partners that we've got, including Pernod Ricard um, and Infield Ag, which Tom Ayres, if you've got a vineyard, uh, Ring Tom, he's excellent. Um, and, and we put together a field blend rosé each year. The Botanic Gardens Foundation take half of the stock, we take the other half. We use it for tourism experiences and they use it for corporate gifting. So... Um, and I must say that uh, over the last three years, it has gotten better each year. So it's like those vines are starting, finally starting to really mature and produce really nice fruit. So um, we've just recently sent a dozen of those uh, to the Adelaide City Council. They'll be sending them as part of a, a gift pack to Christchurch to celebrate our sister city relationship. So, um, and, and also it's always nice to uh, send wine to New Zealand and make them realise that, you know, while they make nice Sauvignon Blanc, they're not great at everything else. <laughs> All right, a bit of a timeline. So again, completed in 2001. It's the home of the opened as a tourism venue with an exhibition, function spaces, and a fine dining restaurant. Around about 2000 was when fine dining died in Adelaide. Um, you know, it simply became a. You know, there are very few places that still run to the flambe trolley and 
and Geradon service and things like that. So it, it ran into some real revenue problems. And so the state government negotiated with the University of Adelaide, being the, the leading winemaking institution in the Southern Hemisphere, actually, to perhaps take it over as a combination of tourism venue and educational facility. The university worked on that for a year, about 18 months, and then in 2005 basically just said, look, we need to become a function centre for financial survival. Um, it's not... The National Wine Centre still doesn't print money. Um, it's, a, it's a venue that's very much publicly minded um, and has a great deal of floor space that's dedicated to, you know, public use rather than back to, um, rather than back to revenue generation. However, you know, that's one of the benefits of being owned by the university, um, that they see the value of the National Wine Centre rather than simply as a commercial shareholder might or a commercial owner might simply looking at the revenue per square metre. Uh, but one of the th problems with that was that, you know, tourism became a little bit of um, uh, less of a focus. And, and so, you know, as uh, in 2018, a new board and management team, we, we sat down, reassessed what the National Wines had actually needed to do, and we set some strategic goals. So here's where we get to the, the meat of the, the presentation as to what our role, or what certainly what we see our role actually being. The first one is to be a valued asset of the Australian wine industry. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty big industry, and we'll get onto some of the stats in a moment. What I will say there, though, is that lady there is Sue Bell, and if you can get a hold of her rat and bully Malbec, I absolutely tell you to get some of it. She's not only a good winemaker, but she's a really good human being. Um, and um, please, you know, do look out for her wines if you can. I could have picked any one of, you know, 2,100 odd winemakers, but I picked Sue. Here's the most complicated slide that I've done for the entire presentation, and it comes direct from Wine Australia. This is a, a really good snapshot of the Australian wine industry um, and why we think it's a really important industry to represent. You can see there the vineyard areas, um, and you can see there one of the things that's interesting about the December 2021 snapshot is that China was still our largest export market for 2021, but only because of what happened before the tariffs came down. Um, so when you see the 2022 snapshot, it's not going to look like that at all. And we're in, increasingly, Wine Australia are expending effort in opening new smaller markets. They're talking a lot about Denmark at the moment, which seems strange. But the UK and the US will certainly um, remain as our, our two most important international export markets for the next little while. Um, why, we, why we feel that the wine industry is so important is, is that down there, there's a, nearly 164,000 people employed in the wine industry across Australia, making it a reasonably sized chunk of the agriculture industry. Um, 2,156 wineries this year, that's fluctuated a little bit. Uh, it dropped below 2,000 as we went through 2020 because people obviously were getting in and out of the industry, but back up to a really healthy level now. And um, one of the things that I think is really important is when you look at the total wine grape crush in Australia, it's Shiraz. It is Shiraz, Shiraz and Shiraz. We I, I can't think of a wine region in Australia, even the cold, really cold ones like Tasmania, where they don't grow Shiraz. It's a really big varietal for us. All right. There are 65 wine regions in Australia, which is just um, pretty bizarre, and even some in Queensland. Um, the, obviously, in Queensland, they need a really high elevation to, uh, to get to where they're going. So you can see the spread of them, and you can see that the, the South Australian wine regions aren't as geographically large as the other ones around the, the country, which is pretty interesting. Victoria has more wine regions than uh, South Australia. And to be honest, if places like the Yarra Valley hadn't ripped out all of their uh, vineyards to turn their land into dairy farming, the National Wine Centre of Australia might be in Melbourne. But uh, obviously over time, it wasn't until the 1960s that they got back into really growing uh, grapes in a lot of areas around, uh, around Victoria. The biggest production region on its own is the Riverland. The amount of wine that comes out of the Riverland is actually quite astounding. Um, so uh, let alone Murray, Darling and Riverina, but the Riverland is certainly the, the, the biggest production uh, region that we've got. This is the, all the amazing stuff that you get to learn when you go and work at the National Wine Centre. You find out a whole lot of stuff about uh, one of our biggest and, and most popular industries, but there's a, a lot of detail in it. One of the things that we did to represent these regions and to represent the industries was, was during the 2020 lockdowns when people weren't allowed, particularly in Victoria and, and New South Wales, weren't really allowed to go out. So 
you might remember being able to get to South Australian wine regions, but in Victoria in particular, tourists and new, new clients just completely dried up. Uh, people weren't even allowed to open their cellar doors. So our head sommelier, James Bowden, who's a, a genius and actually a nice bloke, um, he devised a way to get seven different wines from each region into these little vials. Uh, we packed them, we sent them out uh, to people who were interested across the country. Um, and then you'd sit down on Zoom uh, on a Thursday night with your own little cheese plate, seven wines, six wines that you'd be given tasted notes for and a mystery wine at the end. And we did the A to Z of Australian wine regions, uh, starting with the Alpine Valleys and, and finishing with Yarra Valley. So it was one way to try and help wineries and wine regions, you know, transition to getting people to buy wine online during that period. Interestingly now, most wineries are reporting that 30% or thereabouts of their income as an average across the industry is now from direct to consumer or you know, online sales. So that's uh, been a real, real change. So that actually won us a Pivot and Innovation Award from the Restaurant and Catering Association. It was uh, fun to do. Um, and you know, half a bottle of wine on a Thursday night and, and sit down and learn something was good for fun. Look, here's just some of the ways in which Australian wine leads the world or has led and continues to. Um, refrigeration as a winemaking technique came from Australia. Bag in a box. Uh, everybody, loves a, everybody loves a goon bag. Um, and that was invented. I think it was Angos 1966, if I recall correctly. If anybody wants to correct me, go ahead. Um, Drip-fed watering in vineyards. Um, screw caps. So we're finally convincing the rest of the world that putting a piece of a dirty North African tree in the top of a wine that you've worked so hard for might not be a great idea. Uh, and that you want to go for the, a closure that's a little bit more sure. Fusey Val Riesling was the first wine to, to go under still. Um, the, the reason why screw caps are so important is because previously, and having worked in restaurants, you know, for a lot of my life, one in 12 bottles is fails under cork on average. So, you know, to go to something that means maybe one in 100 might fail is, is just, you know, good business sense, really. We do a lot of work here on smoke tank. The Australian Wine Research Institute does a lot of work on that because we have bushfires in Australia. It's, it's something that happens. So um, we do a lot of that and we're doing a lot of research on, on drought resistant varietals. Um, so there's a lot of things that go on in the Australian wine industry that are actually world leading. And I think everybody appreciates just how forward thinking we are. It's, it's a representation of what I think Australia really is. Um, we're inclusive, we're innovative, we tackle adversity. And most importantly, we just have a go. Um, and we're not bound by the old world rules of appellation. So in Bordeaux, you're allowed to use, I think it's now seven grape varietals to go into a Bordeaux blend. In Australia, we don't care. We'll throw it in the ground. If it grows grapes, we'll squeeze it, chuck it in a bottle and see if it tastes nice. And that's that's the way that Australians approach wine, which is why we, we don't, um, like even in the Barossa Valley, which is obviously Shiraz dominant, there's still so many different things being grown out in those regions. All right. That's kind of the end of the wine industry piece, guys. That's goal one. The second goal is to be a must-see tourism attraction in South Australia. And if you will indulge me, I'm going to stop talking for a moment and just play this. And anybody who says this is a shameless plug, go right ahead. I'm willing to cop it. I wonder if this will play. There we go. Can you all hear that, guys? Can't hear it? No. Uh, well, it's probably not as much fun without the music. Yeah, probably. I'll kind of talk over the top of it. And as you can see, this, you know, that's the largest collection of enigmatic tasting machines in the Southern Hemisphere. So there's 120 wines to have a go at all the time. We still currently do have yes, the range if, in the machine, even though yes, we don't and have If you can drop taste. out of the session and again do the video, probably it might work, the audio. Let's see. Yeah, turn it down for a moment because at the end of the day, it's a, it's a video and it's, it's background music going on. Maybe I maybe I am more interested. Um, we do a lot of different things for, for tourism experiences, um, and, and we realise that not everybody in Australia has enough time, uh, or, or visitors to Australia have enough time to get out to all the wine regions they want to go and see. So the interesting balance that we need to strike is showing as many wine regions as we can, encouraging people to actually go out in the regions rather than simply coming to see us. If the last thing we want to do is take money out of wine, take money away from wineries, take tourists away from wineries. But we do want to stimulate their interests and get them to, to commit to the next stage of their, their kind of wine discovery journey. So 
that's a that's a big part about um, what we do. Okay. The video concludes. Obviously, with that, we we have to accept that there are some stark realities in the tourism space. Um, COVID safety and border uncertainty are things that we're dealing with currently, obviously, and, and they're things that, you know, as far as CBD tourism, they've been really, really difficult. Regional tourism in South Australia has obviously been quite good, but CBD stuff's been hard. But it's an online travel world now. It's, it's all about online. Everybody needs to take a clip on the way through and you've got to continuously reinvent yourself and, and bring new products to, to the market. That's the, the reality of being a national wine centre. And the more people that you can talk to, the better. So we use sommeliers. That's James there, our, our head sommelier. We use sommeliers to do that. We're not a winery. But a, we don't make it. But B, we don't have a single range of wines for people to look at. We've got wines from all over the country and, and all different types. So we're about trying to stimulate people's excitement about going and doing new things and seeing aspects of the wine industry they might not otherwise. The third goal is to be a valued asset to our owners. Um, it, it's pretty crazy when you think about the internet. <laughs> there on the left and Wake Campus now on the right. All the wine winemaking now happens at Wake. Obviously, it used to start, used to be out at Roseworthy. Um, I'll put the logo on there um, because that is our official logo. Wherever we go, wherever our logo goes, the university logo goes. Um, so we feel that responsibility to to look after our owners very keenly. Uh, for all of those who are university folk in the in the um, in the audience, please report that back to your department heads. Um, but what's a, what's pretty important about um, the University of Adelaide is that seventy five percent of winemaking graduates in Australia of graduates that is come from Adelaide, come from the or not from Adelaide, that study at the University of Adelaide. There are two other big universities worldwide in this space. It's the University of Bordeaux and California at Davis. Um, but the interesting thing over the last few years has been um, to expand. It's not just about wine making, but it's about wine business. There's now an MBA in wine studies going on in the Department of Professions There's or well, Faculty of Professions. There's wine marketing. Um, we did a study at the, at the National Wine Centre where um, one of the doctors came along and laid out a whole heap of wine labels and then measured everybody's taste. They put the same wine in five different bottles and depending upon the, the type of wine label and how attractive it was, whether people liked it and then whether they wanted to purchase it. So it was those are the kind of studies that go on and the kind of detail that uh, the university is into. So we provide a really public face for um, that wine program for the university. And the fourth goal, um, and our last strategic goal is to underpin all of these activities through, you know, making money out of food and beverage, really simply. Um, I think everybody might recognise Michael Atherton there on the um, on the left, speaking to us, the, not the test match dinner. If anybody can recognise the back of uh, their head, please, uh, you know, stick your hand up. Um, that was a, a really good night, and it's just an example of the kind of things that we like to do. Yeah, the, oh, you can too. It is you, Paul. Um, Obviously, we do a lot of weddings. We did 106 weddings in 2021. Um, that's an unusual year because we had a lot of backlog out of 2020, but it is a, a part of what we do. And just on the right, I've, I've put a picture of the Streaky Bay Hotel. Um, each year we go out there and we do, as part of the Tasting Australia program, we do a taste of Streaky Bay. Our executive chef and head sommelier um, do a, a lunch out there. And I know Helen and Grant King came along last year, wanted to come to lunch, but we were sold out. So um, hopefully they've, they've got their bookings in for this year. So those are the four things that, that we regard as our job, as our role. Um, and in terms of moving forward, uh, and last slide, in terms of moving forward, our job is to be the eastern bookend of Adelaide's cultural boulevard going all the way down through um, in, in here. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but those, most half of those buildings are gone now. Uh, that's lot 14, and when the Aboriginal Arts and Cultural Centre goes up, it's going to be a really interesting linkage from, from there through the Botanic Gardens to us and then all the way back up through the Cultural Boulevard. So we're looking forward to being part of that um, that experience. Thanks very much. Well done. Thanks, Jason. Uh, we're open for questions. Okay. If you can uh, stop sharing your sure. screen, Jason, we can see them who's asking the question. I'm done. Do I stop sharing my screen? Is that what I'm supposed to do here? Yes, please. Yep. Stop sharing the screen. Yes. 
So Rajiv, is Cam here? Can I ask a question, please? Yes, sure. Cam. Yep. Thanks, Jason. That was absolutely fabulous, and I think it's it's tremendous to see just the importance of a uh, an agricultural industry or you know, manufacturing agriculture retail to South Australia. Um, and uh, I actually bought a uh, um, wine tour package at one of the not the test batch dinners, and I invited whatever it was six or seven of my friends who were all South Australia, and um, we had an absolutely amazing tour. Uh, the sommelier was brilliant. I, I forget his name, unfortunately. I would like to sort of recognise him. Um, but they were, to a person, all amazed at just, um, you know, the story of wine uh, in South Australia. So, I mean, it, it, it's uh, the, the wine centre has such a huge potential. And I, and I think the other thing, too, that a lot of them didn't really understand was it was the National Wine Centre. It's not the wine centre. It's the, wine, the National Wine Centre for Australia. And it would be one of the only, I explore, I mean, I've got the space center now, but it would be one of the, the few things that we have in South Australia that is sort of has that national focus. So, uh, you know, congratulations on all those tours. Um, and and clearly you've identified a fundraiser with the uh, fines from going through red lights. And if we could just direct them to the um, Adelaide Rotary Charitable um, Operations. <laughs> Talk, talk, you know, just, uh, it's just, it's, it's a little skim off the top, and it goes to a good cause. So we, think we should pursue that. But my real question was: in the uh, exports, you had uh, Hong Kong at seven percent. Um, with the relationship with China, um, do we expect the Hong Kong um, exports to increase as a way of moving wine into China, or are we actually going to uh, um, de-risk the supply? Um, yeah. Or from a base and, um, you know, focus on other parts of the world? Look, this is probably more a question for Wine Australia than for me, um, Dan, but I, I know I, I try to keep in touch with, with everything that's going on. I think there's some really interesting uh, ways of wine moving through Hong Kong to get into China right now. Um, I know Penfolds are going to open a bottling plant in China. Um, that's something the Treasury are looking to because they need to globally de-risk themselves from, from the exposure that they've just, they've just had. Um, I do, I do think that um, it will probably end up being more that the tariffs will be applied into Hong Kong as well. I, I think that's just generally the path that, that the Chinese government's chosen to take. Uh, 212% tariff is a, is a heck of a thing to put on a bottle of wine. So, um, again, Wine Australia's focus now is on going back to other markets and, and uh, trying to make sure that they, they stimulate those to the point that the export can be taken up. Thanks, Jason. Paul had his hand up for the next yep. question. Um, so, Jason, I've got a question. In the stats, you had, I think, 167,000 employees roughly in the industry. Does that take into account, you know, the people that work in the bottle shops and the, um, the drive-throughs and those things as well? No. So it's really a, a much bigger number that rely on that industry. Hospitality, uh, bottle shop workers, etc., and retail, uh, retail um, bottle shop workers belong in hospitality uh, as, as far as the industry vertical goes. Right. The, uh, the 167 does include all the way down to distributors, though. Right. So okay. you've got companies, companies like Treasury or Pernod Ricard or Samuel Smith and Sons, for example, which is you know one of the, the biggest distributors yep. in the country. They they do belong inside that number. And, and I had a second question, which is of um, the, the, the politics of it being a national wine centre, um, do you get any grief from the other states that it's in South Australia or is everyone happy for it to be here? It depends on who you speak to. There are some who... Um, one of the things that the National Wine Centre has suffered from and continues to and, and what the A to Z of Australian wine regions helped us with is that half of the wineries in Melbourne wouldn't have even known that there was a National Wine Centre in Adelaide. Um, right. you know, it's a pretty diverse industry. However, if you talk to somebody like Bruce Tyrrell uh, from Hunter Valley, who was around when it got funded and seriously wanted it to be on the rocks in Sydney uh, rather than here in Adelaide, he, he's still bitter um, about it. Right. So you, you, do, you do hear about it. But really, it's, it's our job to get back out and re-engage with that national industry and let them know that we are here to send people out to them. Um, yeah. It's really interesting when you see people come in from Victoria and go, oh, yeah, this is great wine. Where's this from? And you say, oh, it's from Victoria. And they go, no, it's not, can't it? Um, because right. so many people don't know what's in their own backyard. So that's part of the job. 
Okay. Thanks, Thank Jason. You. Thanks, Paul. Florian had a question after that, Darcy. Florian, first. Uh, this might be a little bit blasphemy, but it is technically possible to create synthetic wine, as in like wine without grapes. Has that ever come up as an issue or shown up or is basically has, has the wine industry successfully destroyed that science part? First of all, you should wash your mouth out with soap. <laughs> That's exactly what I was going to say. Exactly. <laughs> Kick him but out of the road. Wine. I mean, non-alcoholic wine is going to be the next thing. It's going to be big. Trends yeah. of drinking, and I know this happens in Cam's industry as well across beer, drinking trends for younger people are to drink better but less. Um, so we're going to see that. But there's certainly still a desire, that the health desire or the fitness desire that everybody's got. Um Non-alcohol or light alcohol wine is certainly something that's coming. Mm. doesn't seem to happen very much in reds. It happens in whites at the moment. I think there's some real problems with getting reds to do it. But no, Florian, you know what? I've never even heard of that, and I hope I never do again. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Jason. Darcy, next question. Yeah, thanks very much, Jay. It's great talk. Um, I know your 120-odd wines that you have there for tasting, you have uh, a number of them that are, are fixed there all the time like grains and so on. Uh, what percentage do you change over and how often do you change over the other ones and how do you get the representative view of the whole Australian wine industry through your selection? Uh, through a great deal of spreadsheeting work and negotiation, Das, in terms of getting the representation right. Um, we don't tend to lean very hard on suppliers and say we, we try and find wines that we really like and that we think tell a story. Um, a lot of wine is about place. Uh, and if you can get a wine that really speaks to its place, then we'd like to showcase it. There, I think at the moment out of the 120, I think we're doing 45 out of the 65 regions um, are represented. We change over seasonally. We do about 40 of those bottles definitely change at, at each season, um, summer, autumn, winter and, and spring. And then if we see something that we're really excited about, we'll just change it over. The machines keep the wines for 21 days because they, they pump an inert gas in, they pump argon in so that a wine a bottle of wine that you open at home will last for five days. Anything after that, you really should be making gravy out of it um, or, or, you know, a, a Bur Blanc or something like that. The, um, but after 21 days, it comes out. Um, actually, we normally take them out at around about 18 days because you, you get a little bit... We, we tend to not be, to be a bit worried about it and we want to make sure that the wine presents itself properly. What, but, do you take them home then? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, mate. <laughs> well, starts, I mean, we, we might have the off, off with the crew. Uh, a lot of it actually ends up, you know, particularly if it is starting to get a little bit suspect because we do check, we do check the wines and, and, and smell yeah. them. Not, not, um, tend to, you know, we, we send them into the chefs. There's an awful lot of jus that goes into a function for 350 people with beef fillet. So, you know, um, it's amazing how much wine a kitchen can get through. Uh, yep. <laughs> Could just one quick one that the woman at Rat and Bully, can you tell us a bit more about her winery? Sue Bell, it's um, Bellwether's the name of the wine label. Oh, right. Um, yeah. it's, it's down there in the, in the Coonawarra. Um, it's, it's pretty old school uh, in terms of, um, you know, the winery itself, but she's a really innovative thinker about wine and she does things, you know, really um, not fresh style. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a fresh style in terms of it, it being stylistic. But the wines are just always good. Um, but she's she's a true believer as well. You know, good fruit makes good wine. And so she takes care of things from the moment it comes out of the ground. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Jason. Uh, Simon has a question. Simon Drew. Yep. Um, thank you. Yeah, good talk. Thanks, Jason. Um, just first a, a point for everybody that the oldest vineyard in Adelaide was in fact next to me in Melbourne Street. It was there till 1990. There was about, an, I reckon it was about half an acre. Wow. But, um, Pierre's was Bella Putter and his family owned and, uh, and they actually farmed till about, till about 1990 when they developed it. So wow. that's amazing. Um, the question I wanted to ask was, what is the, the thought around linking um, that western end of the wine centre through the, the Botanic Gardens to, to Lot 14 because, um, you know, at the moment what happens there is pretty messy um, and it's very complicated to work your way through the Botanic Gardens. It's not overly attractive going down the main road. So 
you know, are there some plans afoot to, to work with Botanic Gardens to do something that, uh, that, that draws people more directly through there? Um, there's a, currently a proposal before government, Simon, so I can't talk too much to it. But yes, that has been examined and is, is under consideration. Okay. Some of it's got to do with the footpath as well, because I don't know if you've walked around there at night, but when a bus goes past you, it's actually dangerous. Yeah. yeah. Um, it narrows down to about three and a half feet. Mm. And, and that's, you know, and that's something that obviously we're keen to address because we, you know, otherwise you get to the Botanic Gardens and it becomes a full stop. And we'd rather be the exclamation mark on the other side of that garden. Yeah, good. Thanks, Simon. David Egan has a question. Yes. Thanks very much, Jason. Uh, great talk. Uh, yes, what would you recommend if you had a, a, a couple of people, a couple of friends coming from interstate and uh, just wanted to, uh, what, what sort of a, a deal would you go go out for dinner or, you know, a tasting or a, um, you know, a knowledge of the of the wine industry and that, what would you recommend? Is, what would you, what's a special? Well, it depends on if it was, a, you know, something that you were just dropping in or whether it was a meal. Either way, we've got structured food and wine matching um, Products. One's called the Taste of South Australia, where we match four pieces of South Australian produce. Um, one's currently abalone, I think we're using to start with, and then, you know, ranging out the kangaroo and beef. And they're matched with wines. Um, and the sommelier takes you through the whole experience. The other one is a feed me menu, where basically you sit down and say, these are the things I don't eat, and the chefs will just continue to feed you. Um, and bring out, you know, about around about four courses. And we match wine to that as well. So, again, it's that, that's the simplest way. Or... Come in, hand over your credit card, grab a card for the Edematics and um, see how much fun you can have. <laughs> yeah. I don't recommend trying to get through more than around about 10. <laughs> I think it's probably... And you had a history tour as well. Uh, yeah, yeah, do, we do have a guided tour at 11 o'clock every day. Okay. So, so yeah. that'll go back to 11 and 3 as soon as we see, you know, some stabilisation in business conditions. Oh, thanks, man. Thanks, David. Uh, is there anyone else who wants to ask a question? I've got a question. Um, it's more about the broader industry. Um, you were saying before that uh, a lot of the wineries are now saying that 30% or more of their sales are happening online. That's obviously been, been a fairly big change in recent years. Up until that point, the wineries were selling their wines to the Dan Murphys of the world at a much reduced the sort of... Um, you know, uh, what would you call uh, wholesale price, and yes. then Dan's put their market onto there. Do you see that all changing now? Is it, it are, they, are the wineries going to get more money? I suppose by doing it online and not having to deal with the Dan's. Well, they do. I mean, look, out of the 120 wines that we put into our tasting uh, range, we would only have three or four of those wines that actually get sold in Dan's. There right. are a lot of wineries that don't go to Dan Murphy's. Right. Okay. So for, for that, for the particular reasons that you just discussed, is the fact that you know, when you when you, uh, and, and look, there's a there's a wide discussion about large scale wineries that get addicted to the volume that it brings them through their retail arm and all of those kind of things, but um, wineries that sell direct to consumer, and we're we're pretty keen to do the same thing for them. Re, most smaller retailers aren't, but whatever they advertise on their online store, that's what we'll sell it for. Take um, so we don't undermine their seller door and their online shopping. That doesn't yeah. always happen with, with independent retailers, but they do generally make more money. They do they, they make more money if you buy it from them online. Absolutely. Yeah. Good. Thanks, Jason. We have time for one more question. I think Cam wants to ask. Mm. Yep. Uh, so, not really a question, Jason. It's really just a comment on one of your points about um, you know the the the, the role on future of the Rhine Centre um, uh, about always being innovative. And relevant to the audience, and I think you know uh, it's it's a clear take-home message for anyone in um, any enterprise or activity, um, and and obviously in um, Adelaide Rotary. Uh, I mean that you know we all face that same in ongoing challenge, being relevant and being innovative, and uh, it was really encouraging to see what you've been doing there um, to you know engage with your audience and um, look at new offerings and uh, try new things. And I mean, that's something we can all take home and, and learn from. So, you know, congratulations and well done. Thanks, mate. Cheers, Ken. 
Thanks, Jason. Thanks for a wonderful talk and presentation. And um, we had 35 participants, but it would have been great if we had more than 100 because your talk and your presentation was really good. And for someone who's been in the university for so long, even I didn't know most of what you've been talking about. It's 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 great. It's a uh, the National Wine Center is an amazing resource we ha which we have in Adelaide, and we are so happy that you are the custodian of it for at least for the next three years. That's what you told me. <laughs> so thanks, and we have a certificate of appreciation, which is uh, which will be the hard copy will be delivered to you. And Grant also didn't get his last week, so I will send both of you soft copies first. And whenever we meet next, we'll give the hard copy. Thank you. Of uh, it's handing over to President Paul for his closing remarks and status of next meetings. Thanks, um, Rajiv. Um, we do have a few minutes left, and I know Adriano mentioned at the beginning that if anybody had questions about his um, uh, presentation, we could raise them now. So has anybody got any questions for Adri? I can't see the whole group, Rajib, so if you can see anybody that has questions. No questions? Okay. Well, thank you, Jason. Um, no, no, Paul. No one has questions. No. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Um, what I will say is that um, while Adri was talking, I went online and set up my regular donation to the bowls, and uh, it was very easy to do. So uh, thank you for talking us through that, Adri. Um, thank you, Jason, for a very informative talk. The way you present is just great. Um, there's a lot of humour in there, but it's also a factual story. And, um, yeah, I just thought it was it was really, really good. So congratulations and thank you for that. Next week is Australia Day, um, so we won't be having a meeting next week. And then after Australia Day, we are hoping to be able to meet back at the Oval. Um, we have a board meeting tonight and uh, we'll have hopefully have an update of where we stand there. Obviously, we'll let members know as soon as is absolutely possible, um, but hopefully we can get back to face-to-face -to -face, um, sooner rather than later. Um, Thank you, everybody, for attending today. Um, I saw that we had uh, Michael Nichols as well, one of our new members. So thanks, Michael, for joining us. Good to have you here. Uh, on that note, I'll say goodbye and thank you to everybody and look forward to seeing you hopefully in a fortnight. Bye for now. <laughs>